Thank you very much. Our discussant, our first discussant is uh, Goshu Wuldi. I mentioned earlier he's a peace fellow here at the uh, Institute of Peace this year. He was the foreign minister of Ethiopia from 1983 to 1986, held a number of positions in the government, uh, was also active in the OAU on the Council of Foreign Ministers, uh, and uh, in, with UNESCO and also was involved as a participant in the UN peacekeeping uh, operations in uh, Zaire. He uh, got his education uh, in Addis Ababa and at Moscow Fruns Academy uh, and his law training at Yale and at Addis Ababa and a military diploma uh, in England. Uh, Goshu is doing a project uh, this year uh, as a Peace Fellow at the Institute on the subject of what sorts of negotiated settlements might uh, work out, might be workable uh, in the Horn of Africa. So he's focusing on very much this subject, although perhaps taking in even more complex factors than we are this afternoon. Goshu? Thank you, Michael. Uh, it's a pleasure, but not an easy task, to be a commentator on Professor Marina Otway's paper. The paper is lucid, rich, thoughtful, provocative, and is, of course, reinforced by a very effective and brilliant presentation. Having said that, let me at the outset make the record straight by correcting minor inexactitudes of certain historical facts or events in this otherwise brilliant paper. First, the author begins the history of Eritrea abruptly from the year 1890, just 100 years ago, when the territory came under Italian rule and is silent on its early and ancient history when it was under Ethiopian rule. The fact of the matter is that, as several historians note, Ethiopia had exercised effective sovereignty on the coastal and highland plateau of Eritrea before its colonization by Italy. And despite its tenuous hold over the lowlands, Eritrea, along with Tigray to its southern immediate south, constituted the heartland of the ancient Ethiopian state of its culture and of its civilization. Second, on the conflict in northern Ethiopia, Professor Ottawa states that Eritrea had been unjustly denied the right to self-determination, and that the struggle waged by the EPLF is not one of secession, but of self-determination. I respectfully disagree. The right of self-determination is given to peoples and not to territories. And that right was available to and exercised by the people of Eritrea when they overwhelmingly, and that's the word used by the UN Commissioner on Eritrea, they overwhelmingly decided and as such determined to reunite with Ethiopia through federal association. And with that, the decolonization of Eritrea was complete. The decolonization process was set in motion by Article 23-1 of the 1947 Treaty of Peace with Italy and the Four Great Powers, and subsequently by the United Nations General Assembly Resolution 289, Roman numeral 4 of November 1949, which called for, respectively, for the final disposal of the former Italian possessions in Africa, one of which was Eritrea. That was precisely how other Italian colonies, such as Libya, were also decolonized. It is inaccurate to charge Ethiopia with colonialism for the actions of the four great powers, the United Nations, and the, of the Eritrean population of 1951 for Eritrea's federal association with Ethiopia. Third, the 1977 joint Soviet Union and Cuban proposal for federation of the states of the so-called socialist orientation of the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden, i.e. Ethiopia, Somalia, and South Yemen, 
did not envisage the creation of a separate Eritrean entity, as Professor Ottawa suggests. The records show otherwise. That is to say, with Eritrea as an integral part of socialist Ethiopia, which was so supposed to be the heart of, and Addis Ababa, the capital of the proposed federal dreamland. So much for the minor uh, corrections. On the nature and the causes of the conflicts raging in the Horn of Africa, Professor Ottawa, Ottawa is most persuasive and effective when she systematically digs into the root causes of these conflicts and examines their social, religious, and ethnic dimensions. Her accounts of the organizational setup, ideological orientation, and operations of the various armed and political opposition groups are succinct, informative, and brilliant. She is, however, apparently constrained by time and space from adequately examining the other no less serious underlying causes of these conflicts, such as the material poverty and the deprivation of the people of the region, as well as the rigid state structures presided over by despotic and repressive regimes which have waged war against their people and have driven millions of them into refugee status. But I guess our primary focus this afternoon is to find out whether these conflicts, that is to say, intra and interstate, racial, tribal, cultural, political, economic, and environmental are ripe for resolution, and whether there are opportunities and possibilities for and obstacles to superpower cooperation in resolving them. Questions which Professor Ottawa has adequately answered in some detail and with considerable vigor. Let me state that I agree with much of her hypothesis, analysis, and some of her conclusions. My difference with her is that my concept of the objectives and processes of conflict revolution and possible superpower cooperation in resolving the conflicts are broader and perhaps unnecessarily ambitious than hers. The goals of peaceful conflict revolution and the role of the superpowers and other external actors in that process should be broader than simply trying to bring the parties together in mediating, however important that may be. Conflict resolution in the context of the Horn should also try to address the other tony, complex, and emotional invo problems involved in the Horn of Africa, such as feeding the hungry, caring for the abandoned children and helpless old women and men, reuniting divided families and monitoring human rights violations. It also includes the strengthening of freedom rooted in harmony and tranquility, the enhancement of individual liberty, the exploitation and development of natural resources, and the protection of the environment, each of which is important by itself and an additional break in the construction of the edifice of lasting peace in the Horn of Africa. It seems, it seems to me that few of these conflicts are ripe for immediate resolution. Social cleavages and ethnic or religious conflicts will probably stay with us indefinitely. Last week's ethnic violence in Sudan where hundreds or perhaps thousands of southern Sudanese were massacred is a case in point. Poverty, famine, and underdevelopment will persist for a long time to come. Drought, desertification, and environmental problems will, will, will do show no let up. And the war and the violence will continue to in the immediate future with the year 1990, perhaps, perhaps uh, uh, coming out as perhaps the most violent and perhaps the bloodiest and probably the most decisive yeah, on the war front. So what are and how realistic are expectations for superpower conflict revolution in the Horn? I agree with Ms. Ottawa's general observation that as of today, the possibility of Soviet-American cooperation in actually solving the conflict among regional actors is remote. 
But the reason is not necessarily because, as he suggest, suggests, of lack of vital interest by the superpowers in this strategic part of the world, located just south of the politically super volatile Middle East, where the superpowers are over engaged and over committed. Nor do I agree that the superpowers are not deeply engaged in the country's concern, unless the word is, of course, too narrowly defined, or that they lack access to and influence over the regional actors that would facilitate an intervention, as she puts it. All these may be true, but partially so. While it is true that both the Soviet Union and the United States have avoided direct confrontation over the Horn, that confrontation was remote in the first place and theoretically absent. And, and, and very theoretical, absent any ideological element in the conflict since the conclusion of the Ethiopia-Somali conflict of the year 1977. It may be argued that the Soviet Union's notice of termination of military supplies to Addis Ababa after a year may signal the beginning of the Soviet Union's total disengagement from Ethiopia. That may or may not be an accurate assessment of Soviet intentions. But then one year is one year away. And it is said that a year is a long time in politics. And despite the upheavals in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union is still a superpower for the immediate future. And superpowers do not lightly lose their prestige and influence by sudden, total, and unilateral withdrawals from strategic parts of the world. The US presence in Somalia and Sudan is no less visible than that in the so that Soviets, not to mention, of course, the huge military installations in Diago Garcia. This is combined with high-level diplomatic representation in both capitals. The Berbera base in northern Somalia it is still in U.S. hands, and there are no indications of withdrawal from them. U.S. military assistance to both countries may have been cut as a result of congressional pressure, not executive action, initiative, as Ms. Ottaway notes. And there is no permanence in such actions, only signals of temporary and involuntary displeasure. So atmospherics, political posturing, and psychological reactions, notwithstanding the super, superpowers, are militarily and politically entrenched in the countries under consideration with their influence undiminished. That influence and presence could be employed in the service of peace if that is what the superpowers want. But do they want it? It's my impression that the attitude and the current state of mind of the superpowers to the region is one of disinterestedness, displaying total lack of interest in the countries and the of the region as a whole. Or is perhaps a preference for a policy of inaction and benign neglect over active, purposeful, and decisive diplomacy to resolve the conflicts. Absent invitation from, from and lack of seriousness of purpose on the part of the protagonists themselves to resolve these conflicts. What then are the prospects for resolving these conflicts? What is the framework for their resolution? And do the superpowers have a role to play? Let me state at the outset that there is no magic formula or a single inevitable scenario for peace in the Horn. However, the present climate appears to favor negotiations and political solutions over confrontations and military solutions and should be taken advantage of. Equally, the superpowers and the European community among international actors have a role to play in the peace process and should, put, and should not shy away from that responsibility. A possible and hopefully successful process of conflict resolution may take the following framework. First, domestic conflicts should be settled internally by the parties to the internal conflicts through the fora of national reconciliation conferences. Internal, social, ethnic, religious, and tribal conflicts in Sudan, Ethiopia, and Somalia 
should be resolved by the leaderships of the countries and of the movements concerned, and not by the United States or the Soviet Union or any other country. These are truly internal and homebred conflicts, and solutions to them should be homemade, not imported or imposed from outside. The people and leadership of these countries should see the initiative, the initiative take charge of their destiny, restructure their political, state, and economic systems, make them more responsive to the wishes of the people, and reach out to the politically and economically ex excluded. External assistance or mediation along the lines of the Carta or the Italian government initiative should be welcome, appreciated, and in fact encouraged. But that is no substitute for indigenous initiative and action. For the, in the final analysis, the battle for peace should be won or lost in the hearts and minds of all the people living in these conflict-ridden countries. Superpowers could and should help the internal peace process if requested by, among, among other things, refraining from any action, political or military, that may exacerbate the internal conflicts, by generous contribution to famine relief efforts, by monitoring and protesting violations of human rights in all countries, by reinforcing the Carter Peace Framework or other initiatives, or by launching in concert with the European Economic Community and Japan an independent and joint peace initiative designed to bring peace and development to the region. Second, interstate conflicts should be resolved both bilaterally and through the good officers of the Organization of African Unity. The Ethiopia-Somali conflict should be resolved once and for all within the OAU from framework in accordance with its charter and the declarations, decisions, and resolutions of the continental organization. There is just no other way but that the superpowers and other countries should impress upon the countries concerned to abide by the decisions and revolutions and declarations of the OAU. Third, a regional capacity for conflict resolution should be developed along the lines of the Contadora or ASEAN peace framework. The framework should aim to bring the countries of the Horn or of the Nile Valley together to resolve interconnected and common regional problems. The superpowers, the European Economic Community, Japan and others may be, I believe, should be invited to assist in the task of peacemaking and reconstruction. Fourth and lastly, internationally, the United Nations should mobilize and enlist the cooperation of the international community, including the superpowers and the developed world, as well as of international financial organizations for the task of reconstruction, rapid economic development, and environmental protection of the region. So to conclude, it seems to me that the recent developments in Eastern Europe appear to have diverted the attention and resources of the superpowers and the developed world. With the Cold War now over, and East-West competition for influence and friendship less intense than before, and the third world robbed of its card of playing off one superpower against the other to further their interests. The South in general, and Africa in particular, in general, and Africa in particular, are likely to be forgotten, and attention and resources begin to flow northwards towards Europe thus exacerbating the north-south conflict. I think it's possible, theoretically at least, to be pro-south and pro-north. But then Europe is after all Europe, and Africa is Africa, and the two never meet. Thank you very much. <laughs>